Hey everybody, uh, thank you first of all so much for uh, allowing me to be part of this virtual conversation on COVID and, and the social sciences. Uh, science communication, the field that I'm working in is, is obviously not just highly relevant, but also very concerned about what's happening around COVID-19 and, and how we can effectively communicate, not just about the scientific and health related facts, but also about the larger societal and economic implications of this, of this issue. And I want to just touch on three related threads of, of, of questions uh, that I think are, are particularly relevant during, during this time. A, I think we're hearing a lot about there being an, an infodemic, a misinformation, disinformation uh, pandemic. Uh, and I want to look at that a little bit more empirically, or at least raise a couple questions about this, uh, and then shift to, if it's not information, then, then how do we navigate and how does our, 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 our what a psychology and communication science tell us about how we all navigate this pandemic and end with what we called and when I say we I mean my co-authors here in a piece that we really recently published in issues in science and technology called accelerated wickedness wickedness and I'll come back to that but let me start with a with a question to which degree we're really in the middle of an of an infodemic as the World Health Organization um, called it. And I think there's a, at least a, a, a couple of open questions, uh, probably more, but, but, but two that I want to highlight here. Um, and one is the question to which degree we're really in a, in a, in a time where, where misinformation and disinformation are more rampant than they, than they typically are. Um, and then they are also for other scientific and, and, and political issues. And, and, and Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation have, have been the target for a long time of anti-vaxxers and people who think that, that the Gates Foundation is out to do population control through promotion of vaccines and other conspiracy theories that are obviously not true, um, but that have just gotten new new life uh, or new lease on life um, with, with COVID-19. But I would argue they're, they're, they're certainly not novel and we have very little um, systematic social scientific evidence that they're that they're either more prevalent um, uh, than they than they used to be, or or or, or maybe more powerful. And and the powerful question, of course, uh, brings me to the second question, and that is, how much of an influence do we know misinformation and disinformation really has on relevant behaviors when it comes to COVID nineteen mitigation and, and adaptation? Uh, if that's social distancing, if that's wearing masks or whatever else, so. Does it really matter? And I, I would argue the answer to both of these questions is either we don't really know yet, or sometimes it's a resounding solid no. We know from decades of research and from, from dozens and dozens and dozens of studies that information, having more information, doesn't necessarily lead to better behavioral choices, doesn't lead to behavioral choices that are more in line with the best available science. And, and uh, Brandon Nyhan and colleagues have done work on vaccine hesitancy, for instance, have shown that sometimes under the right circumstances, more information can even have detrimental backfire effects where it makes people who are already hesitant to engage in, in, in pro-social or, or, or health behaviors um, uh, are, are even less likely to engage in that after being challenged on some of the factual claims. So I guess my, my call at this point is, 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 is for us to really empirically assess where we are as far as a real uh, misinformation, disinformation pandemic that sounds really great at the, at the beginning of a column in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper or somewhere else. Um, but empirically, there's probably a lot to be done. And, and I think there's, it's, it's, it's a call for social science to, to deliver that kind of work. But we also do know a lot about people make decisions. And, and I think we're, we're now hearing a lot of questions I want to cut, touch on, on just two concepts out of the many, many, many that are important as we're thinking about COVID-19. Uh, and one of them is the idea of conspiracy theories. And, uh, and Plandemic has been in the news lately um, as, a, as a pseudo documentary that, uh, that uh, to some degree uh, p potentially has, has influenced uh, uh, public discourse. Um, but I think that the, the question around conspiracy theories is much less um, the question of, of, uh, of, of, of what specifically um, they, they might drive um, a buy-in or whatever else. I think that's an important social scientific question. Uh, but rather how we're in a, in a world that's so deeply disrupted in its foundations. Um, people's livelihoods are threatened. 
threatened. Educational systems are, are, are turned upside down. Financial systems are collapsing. Uh, we can't engage in even the most basic rules of our, our normal way of life. Um, and we're asking people to basically follow simple facts. Um, but of course, what happens is that that all of us don't know what the outcomes are going to be. We don't know how this is going to play out in the long run. We don't know what the interplay of economic and scientific and, and political and regulatory infrastructures are. So what we're doing is something that Fritz Heider and other attribution theorists described 70, 80 years ago uh, when they looked at, at, at shapes moving around and, 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 and showed them to, to participants and participants made interpretations and attributed those two human motivations and, 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 and interests and behavior. Uh, so in other words, if there's a lot of uncertainty, if, there's, if, there, if, if we don't know what's going on, if we don't know how to interpret particular contexts, what we end up doing is we end up attaching our own stories and our own structures. So conspiracy theories in many ways provide the interpretive structures that we simply don't have in a world where science can't provide the answers that are really driving society. And, and if we like it or not, that's the way it is. And I think we need to really treat it as a, as a problem of, of systems uncertainty uh, rather than a problem of, of, of some crazies uh, engaging or believing in conspiracy theories. The second concept that I think is really important here is motivated reasoning. And, and we, we've known this for a long time from communication science, from psychology, from political psychology. Uh, motivated reasoning says that, that if we have facts in front of us that we all agree are true, all of us are still weighting more heavily those facts that confirm what we already believe, hence confirmation biases, and we weigh less heavily those facts that disconfirm what we already believe, that are at odds with what we hold to be true and sacred. The pernicious nature is the second bullet point here, and that is that as a result, we assimilate new information into our belief systems rather than the other way around. So we take information and we make it fit our tribal identities, um, and that's the third bullet point, because we want to protect those tribal identities. Um, the cover of the week, the most recent one here, is a really good example where mask wearing, I think, is increasingly becoming a sign of tribal identity rather and, or an expression thereof, uh, rather than something that, that, that follows particular um, scientific reasoning um, or facts um, that, that, that we've learned from, from, from experts or from news. Um, ultimately, the science on wearing masks, that of course has, has offered arguments both for and against and, and potential risks and benefits, um, is exactly where motivated reasoning is most likely to happen, meaning where we can interpret the exact same uh, potential scientific arguments one way or the other in very different ways depending on what our priors are. And in, in some extreme cases, this will even influence how we think about facts that, are, that should be uh, beyond reproach, that, that we should all agree on, such as uh, death counts, for instance, that come from the government. But even there, you have about two-thirds of Democrats thinking that those are probably undercounting, and the, the, the real deaths, and there's some scientific arguments, of course, that that is true, that we're not able to, to fully count all COVID-related deaths. Um, and you also have a majority of Republicans on the other side who think that they're probably overcounting. Um, so one way or the other, regardless of where you are on the left or on the right of the political spectrum, you believe that the numbers that are being given to you are not uh, completely correct. And that will only get worse as the, 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 the pandemic emerges or, or develops further, rather. Um, um, Adam Marcus and, and Ivan Aransky, who run Retraction Watch, have, uh, have uh, wrote a, a very good piece in, in Wired magazine um, at the beginning of the pandemic or the early uh, uh, periods of the pandemic where they, where they said, look, the science, much of the science on COVID-19 will turn out to be wrong, will get retracted, uh, will get proven wrong by subsequent research, uh, will turn out to be, um, to be corrected um, by, by subsequent research. Um, so the tricky part that we're having, or the tricky problem that we're facing, rather, is that we're dealing with signs that we know will change. And we're, we're trying to, 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 to get that science across without um, making it an, a, a subject uh, or an object, rather, of motivated, motivated reasoning. 
So this brings me to the third issue and what I called, uh, what we call in the piece and issues in science and technology, uh, accelerated wickedness. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is that science has always been complicated. It started with a steam engine as something that had certain decision stakes built in. Obviously there were risks and other things and also some uncertainties about how it would change society and so on that played over long, played out over long periods of time, but they were important. Um, as we moved into, into technologies like nuclear technology, for instance, uh, scientists took more and more the role of, of consultants, of um, um, predicting outcomes, helping policymakers make choices, but the decision stakes got higher and the uncertainties got higher. Now we're solidly in a world of post-normal science, where most of the problems we're fa facing are wicked. There are no good ways out. Um, there's high systems uncertainty, there's very high stakes, and there's really no best path forward on something like human genome editing. We can avoid all risks by not doing it, but that also means we're not going to cure genetically inherited diseases. So you see already the dilemmas. Why am I bringing this up for COVID? Because COVID-19, of course, puts all of this on steroids, not just in terms of the uncertainties and the decision stakes, and we've seen these play out in the last few months, but also in the time frame, in the, in the very compressed time frame that it has played out. Um, and that is, of course, a, a, a real challenge for communication, because not only are we talking about the science behind it, and we already learned how that's uncertain and, and potentially interpreted differently by different audiences, but of course, there are, lo there are lots of other collateral issues. Um, are we going to do contact tracing with phones, which is going to provide governments with data and, and, and ways of doing surveillance that we've never had before? What about our mitigation and adaptation strategies, uh, such as social distancing and, 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 and working from home? Uh, this is data from the New York Times that shows in blue people with high socioeconomic status, more, more affluent folks, um, who are working in jobs that allow them to stay at home more quickly and to work from home in the first place, whereas the orange color indicates respondents or, or, or folks that were, uh, were tracked based on their cell phone location data that, of course, um, isolated later if they even could do that because their jobs didn't allow them to work, to work remotely. So we're already seeing that we're basically dealing with an accelerated, really compressed time frame and a problem that doesn't have a really good solution. Any way out of this pandemic is going to take sacrifices and sacrifices that will require um, a lot of political negotiation moving, moving, moving um, uh, as we move along. So this brings me to the last slide here and, and my, my key argument for, um, uh, for what uh, uh, Brooke Smith, who is, uh, who is um, uh, the director for public engagement for the Cavley Foundation in Los Angeles, and Elizabeth Christofferson, um, who is the CEO and president of the Rita Allen Foundation in New Jersey, uh, have called civic science. Others have called it that as well, but we wrote a piece in Stanford Social Innovation Review a couple of years ago where we, where we called for this not knowing how urgent it would be during COVID-19. Um, and just to put this in context, science communication has always followed what, what well, has long followed what, what people have called deficit models, and they have their place. Uh, Doctor-patient communication, for instance, is just that. Scientists communicate settled science to change behaviors to lead to better health outcomes. Crucially important, but of course only a very small part of the science communication world that we're dealing with now, which has already or had already expanded to what some people call engagement models. Um, Alan Leshner, former CEO of AAAS, uh, talked about uh, uh, scientists not just talking to the public, but engaging with interested audiences, engaging, even co-producing knowledge, um, if, if, if wherever that's appropriate, and ultimately talking not just about the science, but potentially also about its perils, its pitfalls. Civic science encompasses both of these models and goes one step further, and just to put again some of the equity and diversity data from COVID here, um, and, and ultimately says science can provide input in terms of the best available science on what will happen with certain interventions in COVID, uh, but it can't answer most of the questions that are, that are being raised because those are policy questions. Those are evidence-based uh, decisions that will go well beyond the science. Um, and those will have to include values. They will have to include um, financial, economic, regulatory decisions. 
they should involve the best available science, but they will involve, they will have to involve a broad discussion among civic society and science. And I think COVID has, if we like it or if we like it or not, catapulted that us in the center of the need to have those discussions. And our next step as, as social scientists and as a, as a as a as a global community will be to to navigate ways out of those acceleratedly wicked problems that we're facing.